There we What's are. What's up, guys? Welcome to the show. Welcome to the uh, the 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time edition of Flip This Property. No, I'm just kidding. So uh, <laughs> I appreciate you guys all being here. Um, we've, we've been pitching you guys about what the opportunity is in the real estate industry, where we see things shifting, what we've seen here happen over the last two, three months, and uh, where we see it going in the future. So uh, I appreciate you guys if you're joining us live. If you're watching the replay, awesome. Post your questions, comments below. We'll be following up with this thing for days. Um, I want to take a moment to introduce, I have not one, but two attorneys uh, live on this call with us today. So I'm a little bit excited about Time that. For some about that. Okay. Uh, we got the brothers, uh, Paul and Adam. What's up, man? Welcome to the show, guys. Yeah, man. Thanks for having us on. Appreciate it. Good to be here. Thanks. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we've been talking about this deal, uh, you know, at Paul and I have been talking about this deal here for months, but it's it's this exciting time, man, because we're finally here. We're finally at the precipice, right? We're like really we're like ready to go live with it. And uh, you know, you know, I keep thinking what's cool about this deal, and we're going to talk about the industry. We'll talk about the deal itself. We'll talk about where we're heading with things. Uh, but what's cool about this deal right now is for us, it's, it's the best deal we've ever been able to offer investors. Um, and you know, so so I'm excited to share this with this with folks tonight. Yeah, and and I'll, I'll just chime in here. Um, this is a, a unique one um, in that it's kind of a hybrid of obviously real estate, but but technology and and an industry that continues to grow to grow. This asset class, you know, probably didn't get a lot of face time um, up until a couple years ago. You know, multifamily's been big for a decade, uh, where you know folks like me and you can can jump aboard. But storage has been kind of a kind of a, uh, a little bit of a weirder monster that people haven't really gotten into. And it's a great asset class. It's obviously secured real estate if you're an investor and uh, the, the maintenance uh, that's different in storage um, than in an apartment is that it's legit just a garage, um, you know, with technology included. So um, I'm excited to be helping you. Happy to, uh, you know, help run through this thing and talk about the investment opportunity and, um, you know, just get this thing rolling. Absolutely, man. I, I'd say one the one thing I've been saying over and over again, it's kind of becoming my end at this point, but like when I have conversations with this, I keep telling people storage is not sexy, you know, like it's this yeah. is not HGTV, yeah. you know, houses, it's mass appeal, like it's just not a sexy industry. But when you look at the numbers, one of my investors said to me last week, the numbers are sexy. Yeah. I said, you're right. The numbers it's, are sexy. Right? It's not an asset that you want to pull your Lamborghini up next to, but um, yeah. but yeah, man, it's good. But it will be a class A brand new facility and you will want to pull your leg meeting in there. So um, <laughs> so before we get started, keep going here. Um, I'm gonna give Adam a chance to chime in. But uh, Brian Broke is actually joining us as well. Uh, my business partner on this deal. So let's get Brian in here live. There he is. Hey Brian Broke, welcome to the show. How you doing? What's up, Brian? How you doing? Good. Good. Stressful you stress up for us, man. Yeah. So um, we're going to get kicked off. Adam, do you want to add anything to that before we, before we jump into this? No, that's about it. You know, uh, I think people can wrap their mind around the idea of the rentals and kind of the structure of it. But yeah, it's, uh, it's a little different than uh, folks are, are used to, but is something that uh, the numbers work out on. So yeah, um, it, it, it'll be good to show people that a little bit tonight. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things that's exciting to me is, you know, for, for those that know us and some people watching us have no idea who we are, and that's okay as well. Um, Brian and I have been building, fixing, flipping, holding single family, new construction, single family real estate now for over a decade. And, you know, we've, we've for years now have been told the market's going to soften, the market's going to change, the market's going to, it's going to happen in 18. No, it's going to happen in 19. No, it's definitely going to happen in 20. Maybe it's 21. And then bang, COVID comes and guess what? It happened. Right. But, you know, we've been, uh, studying this industry, this self-storage industry for over two years now. Uh, took us almost 18 months to get the first site uh, to approval because of variances and, and township stuff. Um, but we've been setting up for this change for, for years now, for a couple years now, thinking about what's the next move, what happens when, when single family starts to soften a little bit, where can we go next? Um, and this to us was the most logical industry from financial perspective, from uh, an ease of, of construction perspective, and, and Adam, you said earlier, or Paul, you said earlier, the uh, the, le the least amount of maintenance in, in any um, you know uh, asset class, really. Um, you know, we're talking concrete floors, steel and concrete walls, you know, windows to keep clean, and you know, not a whole lot of wear and tear goes on in these type of facilities. So, 
Um, and these are all some of the reasons that led us to this industry. We'll talk about a little bit of our background here in a second. Brian, anything you can add to why this asset class became so exciting for both of us? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, honestly, we, we named uh, the company when we started looking into this, we named the company Legacy Developers because this really is, you know, these are legacy properties. These are legacy plays. Um, you know, th this is, you know, as we were saying before, this is not something that's sexy, but it's something that has proven the test of time um, through mm -hmm. all the upturns and downturns in the market. This is this has been like the little engine that could and it just did steady, steady, steady gains the whole way through. Um, so, you know, that's kind of what attracted me to this asset class um, personally. It's just, you know, it's it's strong and steady through, throughout uh, whatever storm. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. And, and, you know, we have these builder studies, all that, we'll get into that as well tonight. Um, let's jump into the slides here, right? So, so first of all, so everyone understands, guys, this is a development site um, that is a Class A development site. It's in a, uh, an amazing spot in South Jersey uh, in a place called Gloucester Township, which for those of you that are local, so that, so that you understand this, it's uh, where 42 and the expressway kind of interchange. The first exit off the 42 before that happens. Uh, it's, a, it's a hustle and bustle area. The outlet malls were just developed down the street. Uh, there's 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 new developments going up on the street. This is on Sickleville Road there. Um, very, very busy street, uh, lots of traffic and just lots of opportunity. Um, we had full studies, full reports on this, uh, on this particular site. And the initial reaction when I gave this site over to our feasibility guy was he wrote back and said, this is a home run. It's a home run site, right? And he said, I, don't use that too, I don't use that terminology too often, but um, this one based on its location, um, based on its access to major roads and the population density around us. Um, this one in, in, in self storage happens to be location, location, location is the most important thing. This one has that, um, which is why it's such a, uh, it's such a valuable asset, a valuable project to take on. So um, Paul, you want to jump through um, the, uh, I don't know if you want to go the through boring, the boring legal. Things. Yeah. So yeah. Um, importantly, um, anytime you're dealing with raising money and uh, having investors involved, there's there's a number of SEC compliance issues to consider. Uh, first of which is how you present it to listeners. So everybody should read these bullet points. Boring. I keep going to the wrong hand. Um, these bullet points. This is not a sale of security. A lot of stuff has to happen before you can really uh, buy in. And that's what all this boring stuff is. Is um, these are a lot of these statements are forward-looking based on the project happening and going through and all that. And, and that's our plan, but nobody should walk out of here thinking they can uh, invest uh, via Facebook. So <laughs> read, uh, read those and, and uh, you know, go to the next slide. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Adam, anything else to add to that? No, yeah, that's it. Uh, this is just to kind of get to know Legacy, to see what they're all about, and um, and see what they they hope to do and what they're projecting to do and the exciting stuff they're they're working on. Yeah, and, and bottom line, guys, you're going to have to be if, if this is something that's interesting to you and you want to have a conversation further, we'll talk, we'll show you how to do that at the end. Uh, but you're going to have to be an accredited investor, right? This is for accredited, yep. accredited investors only. Uh, looking that up, figuring out what that means. If, if if you aren't an accredited investor, or if you are rather, you probably know it. Uh, if you if you aren't, you probably aren't, and that's fine too. Uh, <laughs> we're happy to, to to take all any and all questions during this thing, and uh, you know help people answer some things for themselves. And you know maybe you just want to get into this type of thing. That's cool too. You can reach out to us as well for that. So, all right, cool. So we're going to run through today. We're going to run through uh, who's the company, who's the leadership team, how did we all get set up. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the industry, some overviews, some bullet points on that piece. Uh, what's our strategy? How do we do it? Um, how we're how we're trying to protect out to the future, where we're going next, um, how we find these type of properties, a little bit of acquisition uh, criteria, and then you know the meat and potatoes is how do we invest? What's it look like? What's the next steps? And what are all the tax advantages? Why is this deal so sweet? Um, I've been just a quick background on on myself. Um, you know, I came from a military background. I transitioned into commercial development. Um, even when I was in the military, I was in, I was in construction, um, you know, because my whole life I grew up in construction. My dad was a, was a drywall contractor. Uh, Brian and I have been working for my dad and in and around construction for uh, since we were nine years old. Yeah. And um, we're out of that military transfer. We're right into some commercial um, development stuff for the government itself. And then eventually worked our way up to, you know, doing the single family home game. So. Lots and lots of background in construction and large uh, contracts like this. 
And, um, you know, bringing that piece to the team, that, that's part of what the leadership team that goes into this thing. Um, Brian, I'll let you talk about yourself for a second here as well. Yeah, my, you know, my background is very similar. Uh, you know, I don't have the uh, military background, but, um, you know, my, my family owned a lumber yard and, you know, the family rule was 10 years old, you went to work. So, you know, I was working on the weekends in the lumber yard and, you know, working in the store every day after work, um, you know, and that grew into, you know, construction at, at the age of 16, um, running my own projects by the time I was 18. And, um, you know, it really gave me, you know, obviously a sense of hard work. Gave me a little bit of a, you know, a firsthand business background um, with the family business and, um, you know, obviously tons and tons of construction, uh, you know, knowledge. Yeah, we've been doing it, been in it for a while here. I, I yeah. think it's great. I, I've heard you say that before and I never really put two and two together that, that your family said you're 10 years old, you go to work. I got a 10 year old sitting in the room that needs me to work. <laughs> Just making yeah. noise. Just making oh, yeah, noise. I might, <laughs> I might have to switch that up a little bit. I'm going to, have to think about how that rule uh, applies to the evangelistic house. I had a, I had, a but, uh, I had one of the delivery drivers pick me up from grade school every day after school. Three o'clock, there was a 14 foot lumber truck out front picking me oh, up. Oh no! Don't don't give any ideas for Eric. Eric might have to show up to our house with a box van and pull tools yeah. to put her to work. Can you get away with it these days? But yeah, let me uh, <laughs> let me let me hop in about uh, yeah. your construction background. So, in all the deals that we work on, you know, we do a lot of these private placements for folks in the multifamily and, and just the debt raise side. The biggest risk for anybody putting money in is the asset taking a dump, and that usually happens uh, through construction. So, it's probably the most important piece in, in the value add model is having a good construction uh, company running the show. So, you know, just just based on, on your guys' background, you know, it's kind of a perfect fit when you need to when you need to renovate the property. If you have a lot of experience and you don't need to rely on some third party that you don't really know, um, that's going to go a lot a lot of way for um, ensuring this project gets done well. So, yeah, no, and I appreciate that. I mean, that, that it's the truth. Um, we know that uh, the, the project starts after the raise, right? I think a lot of people get money aside and they're like, "Man, whew, I'm off to the runnings," right? Uh, yeah. I want you guys to understand, and you'll see how we structure this thing at the end. Uh, we, we, nobody's trying to get rich in one in one project, right? This is a um, you know slow and steady legacy that we're building, um, and getting into that industry, we're planning on doing multiples of these um, with that with that knowledge, with that background, right? Knowing that um, we're capable and have the skills and resources to keep it. Our team is is second to none. Our architects, our engineers, the people that are involved. Our attorneys. Um, so I think you guys will see that uh, as time goes on through this presentation that uh, we're set up for success and we're excited about getting started. What anything I missed there, Brian? Uh, no, no, that's uh, yeah, that, that's that's the the bulk of it. Yeah. Um, Adam saying, Adam saying, my face is under the live thing. It's funny, I don't see it on my screen. Yeah. Maybe if you guys are watching, am I under the live banner? Is this with my face? You know, maybe I can duck down. I'm not sure, but they're trying to get all four of us go. in here. So. Yeah, you're looking. <laughs> I just don't want to disappoint the audience, you know. Yeah, man, they're, they're coming here to see my face. Yeah, they're already disappointed. Put my ugly, put my ugly face <laughs> yeah, up there. That's what I was hoping. I hope like heck, I hope like heck they're coming here for the storage deal, and not, not, for, not. For <laughs> you guys are handsome. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right, let's let's move on, shall we? Uh, let's talk about the industry for a second, Brian. You want to you want to talk about you want to wrap about that for a minute? Tell tell people, you know, what drew us to this thing and what what it looks like. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't see this slide that well from my screen, but I mean, you, you know, I kind of mentioned it in, in the beginning um, that, you know, one of, the, one of the reasons we decided to go into this asset class is just kind of the resistance to all different, um, all, all different markets, you know, it's, it's, um, it, it almost is better in a down market um, and it's strong and steady in, in every market. So um, a lot of that has to do with, you um, you know, the, the demand really, because as people downsize, as, as the real estate market goes down, you know, people love the stuff, you know, they, they might need a smaller house, they might have to go to a, a smaller lease, but they still want to keep their stuff so that they're willing to uh, pay a couple hundred, hundred, a couple hundred bucks a month to keep all that stuff. And uh, that's where self storage comes in. Um, you know, it, it also is um, very easy to raise the rents. Like you might get a lot of feedback in single family or, or multifamily in raising your rents and, and people want to move and they want to find a cheaper deal. Uh, you know, on an average, um, small storage unit at $60, you know, if you raise the rent 10% a year, that's $6. No one's going to move all that crap for $6 a month, but that's six mm -hmm. a month really adds up on the bottom line. You know what I mean? So you're able to, 
you're able to consistently raise those rents and, and uh, raise the value of the property as time goes on. Um, I, and I see in this slide a little bit here, you know, an interesting fact, um, the, the storage, self-storage REITs was the only sector to have a positive return in 2018, the only uh, REIT sector of uh, all the other different asset classes. So, you know, again, that's that's uh, one of the big things that really, you know, turned me on to this. Um, yeah, it's really like like we said earlier, it's it's a location based. Uh, 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 it's, it's location is so so important uh, when it comes to these type of asset classes. What's your competition? What's the area? Um, when when the feasibility study came back on this one, you know we're adding eighty thousand square net rentable square foot in this area. The area itself demands over two hundred thousand square foot uh, of self storage at this moment, uh, which is interesting. Which means you know we're not even, we're not even covering half of what the area can command. And, and there are competition. There's other storage. Uh, facilities in the area. Um, the, the second piece about the industry, which I think is interesting, and it's the reason why there's there's opportunity here, is that people are moving more from the industrial age self storage to retail storefront self storage. You know, ten, even ten years ago, fifteen years ago, if you wanted to sell this to store your stuff, it was off the beaten path. It was in the industrial park. It was down the road. It was dark. It was dingy. Um, and now it's become more of a retail business people want to be on major roads they want it light and bright they want easy access they want to feel secure when they're in there they like the idea that there's a road out front and then people are going by when they're inside and, you know they're going in alone to check on their stuff um, so being able to produce a facility that's bright and airy and open and feels secure you know it allows um, everybody to access the property and feel a lot more comfortable um, and then of course being new and clean uh, it's going to help also pull a lot of the people who you know might be going to the competition saying you know, do I want to store my stuff for the same amount of money in a place that's dark and dingy or a place that's new, bright, fresh, clean, and right on my way home from work? So, you know, for all those reasons, uh, it's just it's, it's a great industry. The other thing is it's good in ups and downs, right? In the down cycle, when people start to downsize, you know, they're looking for a place to keep their stuff. People don't, Americans do not throw away their stuff, right? It's a crazy trend. It's a crazy concept, but it's the truth. And people hold on to their high school yearbooks and never open them. People have all the, you know, their, their chastis from their wedding and all this stuff that, you know, it's in boxes. And if they don't have a place to put it, that's where it comes into, you know, paying $67 a month to, to store their stuff uh, long term. So um, that helps. And then in, in, in an up cycle, you know, which we have been experiencing for the last few years, businesses look for overstock for inventory, location to put their excess inventory. Um, you know, contractors try to put excess material in certain places. So, so. It's, it, it, it works in an increase and it works in a, in, in a decline. So I think that that's one of the things that makes it uh, kind of recession insulated and, um, you know, helps the industry carry along. Vincent Brothers, anything to add to that? Other than, um, you know, just some kind of uh, kind of a legal look at these uh, these assets, too, is that there's there's typically, depending on what state you are, there, there's a storage facility statute that allows for, um, somewhat of a swift uh, taking over from a from an owner on your personal property. So that kind of um, hold over that personal property will provide, I think, more often than not, someone to pay when maybe they don't want to. You know, mm -hmm. if, if the difference is paying that sixty-seven bucks or having it potentially uh, taken from you, where you're not able to get it back. You know, it's just kind of another pressure point for people to keep paying on that asset because. It's not hard for a for a uh, owner to get after that stuff. There's steps to go through, but I think it's just another nudge to ensure people make those payments and keep that cash flow rolling. Yeah, hundred um, percent. You know, one of the things that's interesting about the, this this industry as well is that everything's automated. Everything's everything's uh, electric uh, uh, security controls and things like that. So you know, if somebody's late, you know, doesn't pay the the, the, the rents due on the fifth, and they don't pay on the fifth, their their code doesn't work. They can't get access to the facility anymore. Um, and, and like what Paul was saying, um, the ability to basically auction off their goods, it's only about a 45 day period You advertise for it in certain places. And then you, know, you can hold yourself a storage auction. That, that kind of stuff, it, it entices people to, Hey, if I'm 65 bucks behind, I'm going to go pay that, get my stuff out of there before, you know, I had auction off or, you know, it's, it's worth the $65 to most people. Right. So, um, I think that also makes it really, really interesting uh, and appealing as a, from a management perspective as, as well as an operation perspective. Brian, anything to add? Any, anything I missed? 
Um, no, just just the you know the, the industry as a whole. Most of it is uh, mom and pop owners. I mean, I know everybody goes down. They see self storage and they see you know U haul and extra space and they see all these big names. Uh, what most people don't know is um, that's just a management company. Most most um, you know seventy five percent of the industry is owned by you know small mom and pop operations, even though they have all those big names out there. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, it, and, and here's here's a couple more of the reasons why just owning this thing, operating this thing, there's so many benefits, right? Um, you know, first of all, the cost of actually building the facility. So when 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 you weigh the cost against like building a, a brand new apartment complex, for example, you're at about fifty cents on the dollar of what it costs to build something that's similar in in the residential apartment model, right? Um, so the cost of construction is much lower. Also, the cost of maintenance and management is much lower. We talked about it earlier. These things are all concrete and steel walls and, you know, uh, very, very little um, wear and tear type things. But also the management piece, right? Our management um, will be done virtually, right? So there's literally a kiosk. We'll get to this thing later on. But you know, everything everything is operated virtually. So that you, don't, you don't have a ton of staff. You know, we have maintenance guys on call, obviously, if anything happens. But literally, you're talking about a 100,000 square foot facility that has one toilet. And you know, barely people are going to be coming in and out, right? Um, they assume that each person as a storage unit may come once a month, right? May access their unit once a month on average. So we're talking 700 tenants over the course of a month um, coming in and checking on their stuff. Now, some will come more than others. Some won't come at all because they're just in long-term storage. Um, so the overhead is way lower. Um, the sticky tenants, right? Like Brian uh, had said earlier, you know, if your rent goes up six dollars, you're not going to go pack your stuff up for six dollars a month and move to the competing facility. So usually, once people are in, as long as you know they didn't decide to do something different with the stuff, they're not going to bounce around. If they're relocated, they might empty the unit. Um, but for the most part, once they're in, they need that space. They're in, and they're going to stay a lot longer. Um, the yields are incredible, right? That's the, you know one of the things that's beautiful about this type of facility is the margins. Uh, which also we'll get to here in a second. Um, and the uh, the way that the industry is changing demographically, uh, facilities to keep up with the technology, they have to start to leverage these type of things we're talking about. So a new facility is going to have, excuse me, all those bells and whistles that our existing competition doesn't have and actually helps people, you know, uh, take that leap and do business with us. Can you add that, guy? Yeah. Yeah. No, I would just say, um, so have you guys, you know, we talked a little bit about proximity earlier and, mm -hmm. you know, how important it is. Who are some kind of target relationships you guys think you'll go after for this facility? You know, is it a, is it a assisted living center down the road or is it a university? Is it a, you know, X, Y, Z? Have you guys looked at that? And what are some of those, what are some of those areas you're, you're looking to target? Absolutely. I can talk to that prime when I jump on that question. Yeah, so well, I mean this this particular area is uh, pretty densely populated. Um as Joe mentioned before, it's it's close to highways as well. Um kind of like a central hub there. So um th there's tons and tons of houses in this area. Um we also have a, a newly um fairly new 3 4 years um there, there's a um outlet mall within like two and a half miles from this from this facility. Um, and I'm told, you know, nothing's been approved yet, but I, I'm told in the township there's a um, very close to this facility. There's there's um, a variance in for a new apartment um, nice apartment facility, which is, you know, supposedly going to be pretty big, like 1,200 units. So if that mm -hmm. gets approved and built, I mean, that, that's a no-brainer. But um, even if it doesn't, this facility, um, as Joe mentioned, I mean, the, the, the population density um, could support, you know, two and a half times what we're getting ready to build. Yeah. And, and, and you know, just that apartment building for, for you know, alone, for example, 1,200 new bodies moving in, uh, potentially downsizing to a smaller apartment, you know, not having as much storage as they're used to. That alone could, could really change that demand, increase that demand more than that port is showing, all right? right? So, um, you know, high density residential around. Uh, Brian had talked about the, uh, the outlet malls around the corner. Uh, we found that uh, through our research, a lot of outlet malls would use these type of facilities for overflow inventory. Sure. Um, also, you're talking about uh, uh, the high traffic area, right? When you stand out front of this place at 4 o'clock, it's bumper to bumper traffic in front of this facility. So um, it's going to get a lot of eyeballs. It's in a, a very dense area, and the demand is, is obviously there. Yeah, and, and I'll just chime in there whether this has been anything you guys have looked at, but townships and counties are always looking for uh, – 
other storage too for their burying, whatever the hell. A lot of paperwork needs to be stored by statute. So um, yep. I've, had a, I've had a client get uh, approached, basically begged to build one in a, in a local city, uh, a couple counties south of where I live. And, uh, you know, so there's always there's always all sorts of avenues for looking at that stuff. So it, it's yeah. funny you mention that because um, in, in our zoning board hearing, one of the zoning officers actually said something to that effect. Yeah. Yeah. Like we can use that. Yeah, you know, maybe we can use that facility. It's not that far from uh, the, uh, the the community uh, center, uh, the community center there, where the zoning boards uh, cool. meetings yeah. are held. Um, so and I yeah, I mean. Gonna- Oh, I was, I was sorry. I was just going to add in there too about about the industry you're going through, Joe, and you kind of touched on it. But the idea that this is real estate, but it has so many different avenues for uh, getting somebody in the units, right? It has the the residential side where people have their stuff, but that other side, I don't think as many people are as familiar with the idea that businesses, townships, all these different uh, opportunities that uh, could also be uh, renting these units. And, um, you know, people, people are familiar with storing a couch in a storage facility, but I think it's important to know that this is a, a property that has that ability to cross over and, and serve residential business, commercial, all those sort of things. And that's, that's great when you have an operator that's going to be looking for those opportunities and, you know, um, engaging in that and, and getting more units filled. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, you know, the other big one that's out there is contractors, right? Like they're, you know, these yep, are garage sure. bays. You know, there's strict rules about them coming in and like setting up an office and working out of the facility, right? But most contractors, I know from, ask me how I know, from a decade plus of doing this stuff, Brian and I always have garages full, garages just piled to the ceiling with, you know, excess materials and overflow. And, you know, the Home Depot puts up some pile that's, uh, you know, half price if you You buy some pallets. Well, I mean, you know, I've been thinking about the past couple of days. I mean, how many people are we talking to on a daily basis that, have moved their whole companies virtual. You know, all those yeah, right. people still have stuff that they need to store, but they're not going to be paying office rents anymore. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, that's really been in the back of my head the past couple of days with everything that's going on and everybody working from home with our lockdowns. Um, I think that's a huge opportunity for storage because there's going to be a lot of office buildings that you know people aren't going back to. Hundred percent, and it's not unheard of to have a contractor pay two, three, four hundred dollars a month. To, to rent a garage from somebody, more, five, $600 a month, depending on the size, right? So, you know, this could be half the cost in a secure facility that they can access whenever they want. And, you know, so again, I, I think that there's there's a lot of, that's what's kind of cool about this. You got you got upsizers, downsizers, everyone in between, the contractors, the townships, there's, there's so many uh, different areas to target. Um, the reality of it is if you keep your, your prices um, at or close to what the competitors are, are, are offering, but you have a better quality, a better quality product, a newer product, a nicer product, and a well-maintained product, then you're probably going to win that business more often than not. Right? I like it. So, go ahead. So let's jump into acquisitions criteria, right? What does it look like? Why are we buying this first facility and developing it? What else do we look for when we're trying to find facilities like this? Um, number one is, you know, we're looking at all different markets. Again, remember location, 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 right? So um, these deals make sense as long as the demand is there for the deal. So, you know, we're looking for target markets that are densely populated, of course. Um, we're trying to end up with uh, a minimum of 60000 net rentable after the fact. And there's a, there's a specific reason for that, and that is because the, the REITs that we talked about earlier, your big, your big, uh, your big uh, storage buyers like Cube Smart and Extra Space and some of the other ones, they want a minimum of 60,000. That's their threshold. When they're looking at deals, they want to say, okay, that fits our criteria. Uh, we'll make you an offer. And in order to make to get the highest offer out of them, we want to make sure that, 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 that all of our facilities check all the boxes for them. Um, that's a big one. That's one of the thresholds, you know, anywhere from 60 and above, um, generally under 100. Uh, and that's why we came in right at 80,000 square foot in that rentable. Um, it's a four acre lot. You know, it kind of it kind of ticks off all the the, uh, the things that they look for in order to make the strongest offer, right? Um, we're either looking for value added or development or repositioning. So in some of our facilities, we're actually taking like uh, Dark and Walmart, for example, and we're re- repositioning it as a storage facility. Um, this particular one we talked about tonight is a straight development site. It's four acres of ground that you know we're going to start from scratch and we're going to build a brand new Class A facility. Um, but we're also looking for other repositioning opportunities. So if you're watching this, or you're watching the replay, um, and you might have storage deal in front of you, or you know someone that does, feel free to reach out. We'll make sure we try to create an opportunity for, for everybody, right? Um, and then just the fundamentals, like we've talked about, we're kind of beating the horse there. But 
understanding the, dem the demographics, understanding who's around you, understanding the businesses involved, how we're going to market it, um, all play into, uh, again, we have, I don't know, what, a 100-page feasibility study on this, Brian, maybe more. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. Yeah. Sure you guys are, you are interested. Um, that basically, you know, says, again, this is a home run site. This is the place to do it. Um, if you're going to develop, this is the, this is the spot. So anything I, I missed there, Brian? No, just to add that, you know, that feasibility study is huge. You know, we think, you know, we have a deal. Joe and I, you know, we, we do our research and we do our things and we say, okay, we think this is a deal, but we don't even trust ourselves, right? We're ordering a third party feasibility study. Let's let's get mm -hmm. the third party that does this professionally. Let them tell us if this is a deal or not. And uh, in this yeah. case, we, we absolutely have a deal. Yeah. And by way of that, you know, our third party is, is a company called Cutting Edge. They're actually based out of Utah. Um, and I came across them. Uh, just by reading another feasibility study from another report, I thought, man, this thing's incredible. I got to reach out to these guys. Um, so I did. And literally when they do that study, first of all, you know, it's, it's, I don't mind telling you guys, a $10,000 report to have this thing done. I mean, it is all encompassing feasibility of the area. It tells you the demographics. It tells you what to build, what not to build. And at the end of the day, um, the guy who did our report uh, is a guy who's been in the business since 1984. Um, and literally took extra space public back in the 90s. I mean, he was working for them nice. at seven locations, right? Um, now they're you know, arguably, I think they're the number one storage company in America right now. So um, he's got, I, I don't know anybody else that you can command that kind of uh, history and respect for his knowledge of this industry itself. Um, and, and this is the guy that says, you know, home run facility, home run area, right? So, um, and, and we've since done a couple more reports with him, just super, super knowledgeable guy. So, not only are we going to do our own study, but we're not going to rely on our own our own, our own thoughts and, uh, and emotions. We want to go back to the data, right? My buddy Mark says data, not drama. So uh, we focus on the data. We focus on what the reports say. Uh, and again, this is a strong submarket for, for uh, a new development deal. Yeah, and, I, and, I, and this, you know, we, we're not able to make this a 24-hour uh, live webcast here. But I, I think it would be important for anybody that's interested in this project. That feasibility study is really impressive. Yeah. Um, the guy goes into detail, uh, deep in detail about the project and, and, and kind of how he, he sees it as a real good fit. So, you know, we, we should definitely forward that on if somebody has some interest because it's, um, it's powerful stuff. Yeah, and, and just to add to that, Paul, is the fact that this is site-specific feasibility study. A lot, of, a lot of our competitors will right. go out there and they'll do like a, a high-level, you know, should you know, should a self-storage fit somewhere in South Jersey type of thing. This is one done for this specific address. Like, you know, yep. is this is it going to fit? Is it going to work? Down to the unit mix and everything else, right? So, very, very in depth report, um, and, and just it's super interesting. You kind of geek out a little bit and read the stuff that he says about the industry and you know the construction costs and the maintenance and how and all. It, it's just it's it's a really interesting report to read for sure. So let's jump into the kind of meat and potatoes here a little bit. I know um, for some, I don't know if this is hard to see or not. Oh, our boy Tim Ross is on is on is on the call, guys. That's that's pretty special. Cool. Whoa! <laughs> I don't know how we got Tim on the call? Um, but yeah, I mean, this is our high level um, of of the job itself, right? So um, just a couple quick things. You know, purchase price we're one point basically one point five roughly. It's going to cost about seven million to develop this thing. Understand again, it's a, it's a hundred thousand square foot facility. Um, by the time you get to net rentable, which is basically how many square feet can I get paid for? Right, you subtract the hallways, you subtract the storefront, you subtract the bathrooms, and we end up around eighty thousand square foot net rentable. So eighty thousand square foot um, facility that we're renting out, and uh, and to do that, the development cost going to cost us about seven million bucks. Right, that's that's from site clearing all the way to getting the CO, getting the keys handed to us, uh, and uh, taking over the site and letting the uh, third party management company get it filled, get it situated, um, and uh, and get it operable. Right. Um, during that time and in the time it takes us to do that, we're looking anywhere from 24 to 30 months to be conservative. Um, goal is really, I think it'll take us less than 12 to 14 months to build the thing and then you need some ramp up time to get it filled. Um, but it's going to cost us about 1.5 just in holding and cash reserves and, and closing costs up front. So all in on this deal, we're going to be just under 10 million bucks. Uh, and at a five and a half cap based on the income that we project and based on uh, again, the feasibility studies and everything else that we're looking at, uh, we think conservatively this property is going to be worth about $18.9 million. Um, so we're going to create, uh, when I say create, it's a lot of heavy lifting. For the investors, um, you can sit back and watch the magic. For, for, for Brian and I, uh, it's going to be a couple of years of toiling and getting this 
get this thing just right. Um, but when it's all said and done, we're going to create uh, equity of almost $9 million, right? So we're going to be just uh, just under $0.60 cents a dollar on the dollar uh, all in on this project. Um, that includes investor money. That includes uh, bank financing. We also have a commitment letter from um, a commercial lender to do this deal. They're going to do term to term financing. For those of you who don't know, um, that's basically a construction line uh, of credit to get the thing built, uh, which they pay us in draws. And then uh, at the end, they will then take the evaluation of the property, get it appraised, um, pay attention to the income, pay attention to the rent roll, and give us a good value on that property and refinance uh, us out. And when I say us, I mean me, you, all the investors that are involved get our cash back. And at that point, Tim would say you're playing with house money, right? So that's your investment back. We're going to talk about the returns and all that in a second. But um, at that point, you get your money back and you still have equity in the property in perpetuity. So um, not only are you, you you're getting paid interest during the, during the construction, during the process on your money, but then you're getting to be able to ride along with us for the remainder, right? You get your money back and you still have equity. You still have some cash flow we'll talk about here in a minute. Uh, and you still have a lot of really cool opportunities to get involved in more of these down the road. The idea here is to make all of our investors so exceedingly happy that they're like, man, when's the next one coming up? And uh, where can I roll that money over to? Brian, what I miss? No, that's about it. You know, we, we've, uh, you know, we've built, we've built a history of, uh, you know, trying to please our investors. And then uh, this is a great one to uh, start this asset class with. I mean, obviously we have a couple more in the pipeline that moved down the road, but um, this is, this is, you know, a beautiful deal. This is the one with the best looking numbers. And, um, you know, I, I just can't wait to get it started. Honestly. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it as well. Uh, attorney brothers, anything? No, man. Um, like like any deal, it comes down to the the details, and, and that you're willing to spend you know a chunk of money on the feasibility to make sure this this thing um, scrubs out um, is really important. So you know these numbers, you know, to anybody that's got money burning uh, a hole in their pocket, th this should this should obviously be an interesting one. So um, nothing new here, other than I wish I could store my stuff there. <laughs> yeah. Let me add a couple things to that too, as well. Like. Uh, there's a lot of legwork that got to this level, uh, got us to this place. And then when I said, uh, you know, earlier, it's uh, 16, 18 months we've been into this thing. Um, understand when we took this deal over, this was something that was referred to me by our engineer. He had it fully approved and designed as a um, senior care facility, right? And when he brought us the deal, he knew we were looking to expand and do more self-storage deals. And he brought us this piece of land and said, look, um, it's a senior care facility now. It's approved. However, the owner or the current buyer at the time uh, decided to sell their senior care license to one of the local hospitals instead of build and develop his own site and then have his own senior care facility. So um, it took us quite a bit of time to re-engineer this thing um, and quite a bit of an investment to get it re-engineered, design it, site plans, architecturals, and then bring all of that to the zoning board and get the variance, right, to get to get approval to build self-storage. But we went in there um, back in Rosie had to be what, November at this point, right, Brian? Um, we went back in there in November. We we did our pitch. We showed them what we were doing. Some of the residents showed up uh, initially to kind of fight the thing. Um, and then before we were done, and, you know, hour, an hour and a half of being heard and, and you know, them you know, picking us apart with questions and us giving them answers, uh, the, the residents actually shook our hands and said, we're really looking forward to this because, you know, it's the alternative of, again, a densely populated senior care facility, or a gas station or, you know, a convenience store being there. Um, Self-storage is something that's going to be decent to look at, uh, but also takes very little um, volume of people in each and every day. So it's going to be super quiet for these residents. It's going to be something that, you know, is, uh, is, is not going to be an eyesore and not going to be uh, kind of a pain with all the, the noise pollution and stuff like that. It's going to be a nice, quiet facility. Um, and the township loved it. They gave us basically two or three things to add into the plan. Um, our plans were so advanced at that time, they kind of could see the whole thing. They told us to move some buildings. Um, and so now everything is now up to date, redesigned, ready to rock. And uh, literally, we're waiting for the town. I heard today from our zoning uh, uh, attorney that um, they might be doing Zoom calls for the zoning zoning hearings uh, towards the end of May. So goal is to get, we're, we're first in line on that docket. The goal is to be heard at the end of May. Um, they give us the, the rubber stamp to go ahead. And we'll be able to close this thing within about 30 days of that. So right now we're about 45, 60 days out from closing. 
Um, so for those of you that might think this is an interesting investment, might want to talk to us further, um, you know, the money would have to be liquid and available here in the next 30, 45 days. Yep. Cool. Anything to add to that, guys? I'll keep going. Um, I keep yeah, no, too. I mean, I'll just hop in. Being a, you know, I was on city council myself for a couple of terms, and now I'm on a school board. But um, getting uh, local support is huge in any construction project, especially a commercial one. So uh, if you don't get wild pushback from neighbors, um, you are a unicorn. So yeah. uh, this th th this one's already plowing through and that you got someone to shake your hand instead of, you know, spit at your, spit at your hand. I mean, that that's yeah. a, a really good sign of the project. So, yeah, you know, they're not, they're not in love with the idea that it's being developed, but once we, once we explain to them, like, look, someone's going to develop this piece, like it's yeah. going to be us or a gas station or something else, you know, why would, would you like to have a nice facility? So we're giving them a couple things too. We're, we're going to run, uh, we're required to run uh, city water because it's got to come from a side street. So those people on that side street get the benefit of city water. If they want to switch over from their well, um, they want to go and use city water. So they're excited about that prospect. Um, and as well as, you know, this is, uh, it's something, again, it's not going to be an eyesore to them. It's going to be pleasing to look at and it's going to be quiet. So that they look at that combination and say, well, it could be a whole lot worse, right? Yeah. So let's talk about the area. We talked about the, um, the, uh, Demographics a little bit earlier. Um, just as an idea here, this is our uh, our site, this little blue check. You can see some of the major apartment complexes around it. Um, and then, of course, you can see houses for sale. This is the residential is literally everywhere around here. Um, I know it's a small view, but uh, this is the major highway right here. This is the expressway. We're right off the expressway. Here's Route 42. Um, and of course, uh, Sickerville Road is where that star is. That's our, pro our project. Um, and it is in the middle of all kinds of development. Uh, I know Brian mentioned the new apartment complex that's going in down the street. There's also, um, I found earlier, just in kind of search, I think it's new, they have a complete subdivision that's approved uh, right down here, right, right, like maybe a half mile, quarter mile down the road. Um, that's a subdivision for 35 single family homes. So there's definitely development going on here, uh, as well as already existing pretty dense uh, population, which is good for us. Brian, anything to add to that? No, just, uh, you know, especially in, in this neighborhood, the most, the most, um, the, the closest neighbor stops are, are condos and, and apartments. There's a mm -hmm. ton of single family around there too, but there's a ton of condos, which, which are great for self-storage. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. Let's, uh, hit the industry real quick. This is something that's super interesting, right? So, so my, my, uh, my commercial broker sends me out, you know, as, as commercial brokers do, they send me out a report with, you know, here's the, here's the, uh, single family. Here's the, uh, well, he wouldn't say single family. Here's the apartment, you know, uh, residential apartments, office, um, you know, medical suites, self storage. And in the middle of the self storage review, this just came out last week. Um, the tagline, the headline on the self storage report was uh, self storage is well positioned entering the downturn. Investors make balanced portfolios with assets. And what they were saying in the article essentially is if you have an opportunity to shift out of any other asset class and put money into the self storage class, now is the time to do it, right? Uh, the self storage industry is super well positioned for a downturn. Um, construction starts have have continued even through you know the COVID and the slowdown. Uh, and I've even talking to a lot of boots on the ground friends of mine that are developers, and they're all saying the same thing. They're going to continue to develop through this thing. COVID's not going to slow these things down. Um, there's a need. There's a demand. There's there's market research behind it. Um, this area that we're putting in commands this much storage. So. Uh, marching ahead, uh, we're getting all the, all the green lights from all the right places. So even though COVID hit and a lot of people are kind of sitting on their wallets and thinking about what to do next, don't sleep on this deal. This is something that you're thinking about shifting into. I was literally on the phone a half an hour ago. What is it? 7.46 o'clock. I had a call um, with a new investor talking about, hey, I do a lot of multifamily residential. I love the prospect uh, of uh, self-storage. I think I want to shift some over there um, and we'll be setting up a follow-up call with him. But Look, this is an opportunity to get into an asset class that you might not have ever thought about before. Um, maybe, maybe nobody's talking about it because you know they're, they're keeping it for themselves, right? This is something that's happening behind the scenes, um, and it, it's something that you know maybe you took a hit in the stock market and you're waiting for it to recover. Let me tell you, something like this with the, with the real estate asset backing it uh, and an opportunity to see a great fixed return over the course of the next two years, this could be the best way to ride out that up and down market cycle uh, if you're not a professional day trader. Anything to add to that, guys? That was perfect. 
Nailed it. Yeah, no, just just more proof that you know this isn't this isn't us telling you it's a great deal. This is this is you know outsiders. This is research. This is you know years of, of looking into this and, um, and and getting third party, fourth party, um, you know, clarification that this is a great deal. Yeah, no, it, it really is. I can't say it enough. I'm super excited about it. I mean, I haven't been this excited about a real estate transaction in uh, I don't know years, right? But uh, I, yeah, this is this is way this is way more fun. Um, to me, than, than fixing the flipping single family or developing new construction houses. Um, so let's jump into the meat and potatoes, guys. What does it look like, right? So um, this is, uh, you know, how our investors win with legacy. Um, it might be a little bit difficult to see, but again, I can send you this slide deck after the fact. If you're interested, you guys shoot me a PM, shoot uh, Brian a message at the end, um, and we'll connect. Um, but here's the four ways that you benefit from investing in a deal like this. Now, keep in mind, I have raised 30, 40 million dollars, I don't know, I lost track over the course of the last decade to fix and flip single family houses, right? I have never once, knock on wood, ever, ever, Brian and I have ever given out equity to anybody. So what's super interesting about this play is not only can you make a great return on your investment, what's that? You say so? No, I just kidding. Oh. I said you guys are selfish. <laughs> we are. We're totally selfish. Totally <laughs> selfish. This is the first time that we've been able to not be selfish, right? We That's have, right. There's not to go around, right? We don't have to be greedy on this deal because it makes such good sense. We can actually benefit the people who are investing with us in multiple ways, right? Um, so number one, we're going to give them a great preferred return. You're going to make an 8% uh, preferred rate paid on your investment. Uh, these numbers, by the way, uh, the the these are based on $100,000 investments. So I'm going to show you. Uh, what it looks like right now as it's being offered uh, we're offering 30 shares at a hundred thousand dollars a piece um, i really think we're going to rethink that because the truth is i don't want 30 business partners uh, there's too much communication too many opinions too many thoughts like uh, i really think that we'd love to be able to get this thing down to less than 10 um, investors so i think we're going to make the shares 250. Um, but again we're, we're flexible we'll talk to you if there's something that's interesting to you and you're not there yet uh, or, you know, find someone to partner up with and get to 250. But these numbers I'm going to show you right here are based on 100K. So if you invested 100K in us, uh, an 8% 8 preferred rate, that's number one. You get that throughout the duration of the construction, uh, all the way to the point of the refinance, when you will then get your initial contribution, say it's 100,000, you get that back. Uh, the preferred rate at that time will have earned you about $20,000 based on the 30-month 30, 30 projection. To make twenty thousand dollars plus your initial investment, plus we're estimating the refi proceeds on this property. Now, remember, we said we have about nine million dollars in equity when this is all said and done. Well, at a conservative refinance position on the backside, we're expecting to take out on the refinance about three point two million dollars in cash proceeds. Well, the cool thing is about refinancing if if you're new to real estate or this is something you haven't gone through yet, a refinance is one hundred percent tax free. Right? When, you, when you get proceeds from a refinance, you do not pay taxes on that refinance. Well, you as an investor in this deal are an equity member, right? So you get to participate in the tax benefits of the refinance. So for every $100,000 you invest, you're going to have about $32,700 in tax-free income paid out at the refinance. Now, again, remember, you've already made your twenty k in preferred return. Now you're making another thirty two k in refinance proceeds. So if you're doing the math, we're what, right? 52 seven? Seven, right. yep. Plus you got your initial so investment back. In, in, get your initial investment back plus an extra fifty two thousand seven hundred dollars for every hundred grand invested. Again, that's what we're projecting, um, and that's what it looks like on the refinance. Um, now, at that level, anybody stop you guys can hop in and stop me whatever you want. I'm kind of I'm kind of I'm Griffin now. I, I, I but if you want to talk, <laughs> he's, he's well ca he's well caffeinated, people. <laughs> <laughs> I am too. Um and then on top of it, we're giving out one percent equity for every hundred thousand. So uh, if you know if, you, if it's a million dollar investment, you get ten percent equity in the property, right? If it's a hundred k, you get one percent equity. We're doing one percent per hundred thousand dollar share. That equity left in the deal after all of your cash has been returned, right? You got one hundred fifty two thousand back in your pocket. Your equity remaining in the deal is still worth about fifty seven thousand dollars, right? Your one percent share is worth about fifty seven thousand dollars. So even if we had a conservative appreciation rate, we're, the goal here is to hold, to hold the thing long term, right? We're, we're looking at this as a 10 year plus investment. Again, it's a legacy development, right? And so in 10 years, at a two and a half percent a year appreciation rate, your equity is going to be worth about $137,000, assuming we hold it 
for 10 years. Now, on top of that, little cherry on top, is you still get a piece of cash flow, right? So you're going to get 1% of the yearly cash flow after expenses. It's going to get you about $2,245 a year in residual cash flow. So again, after the refinance, all your money's back. You got your interest. You got your refi proceeds. You still, still have $57,000 sitting in that facility and additional mailbox money coming to you every every uh, quarter, whether we'll the quarterly distributions on the uh, residual income, we'll be getting mailbox money coming in, like clockwork, right? So I don't know, guys. I, I, I've done a lot of deals in my time. I don't know anyone um, that has this type of benefit, this type of return, this, this, this kind of excitement behind it from an investor standpoint. How about you? Yeah, so we, we see a lot of uh, multifamily deals coming down the pike and you know the one one kind of unknown in every multifamily transaction is what is the maintenance coming down the pike mm. um, what's really really powerful with this is this is a brand new shiny asset right um, so you know everything's going to be code enforced there's going to be multiple draw uh, reviews and, and and obviously Joe and Brian are, are going to be very hands-on so um, this is you know that to me as a uh, as a guy that's been around this stuff a lot, that's going to be, that's a real discriminating factor on this project um, compared to other ones, because the other ones you can say, Hey, the roof has been done or whatever it is, but there's still a lot up for grabs, right? I mean, your money is obviously secure in real estate one way or the other, but it's that maintenance piece that you can't, uh, you can't be a fortune teller on. So brand new stuff always lasts. Well, typically lasts longer. And um, I think that's uh, another exciting thing another exciting part of this deal yeah I, I couldn't agree more Brian yeah no absolutely I mean you know that uh, everything you guys said is, is um, right on it's true and um, you know as, as we mentioned long-term cash flow I mean you're also building equity too you know every month we're paying that mortgage and, and building more equity into the into the property as, as it lies so um, you know once you have all your initial investment back all your you know, cash preferred return and refi proceeds back. It's just, it's free money. You know, it's a, like Joe said, it's a, it's a check in the mailbox. And, um, yeah, we didn't even talk about that pay down. I mean, think about that as a matter yeah. of fact. I mean, guys, over the course of five years, 10 years, I mean, you know, typically, um, you know, these mortgages are going to, aren't going to run, you know, 30 years, right? So if we held this for 10 years, the amount of, of equity we would have bought back, we would have paid down your, 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 your interest. And that one percent just keeps going up and up and up and up as the property is being utilized and being uh, matured and being paid down, and so all that equity gets to gets to build up, right? It's a, it's the compound interest. Rate. So, cool, cool. All right. So, what makes it a little bit different? Well, one of the things is the state of the art in security and management, right? So, I you know it's hard to see on your screen, but this little kiosk here, we're using a company called Ten Federal. Um, they're actually going to manage the site virtually. So what happens is when you come to the gate, a live operator actually comes on the phone and comes on the screen and helps you pick the right location, pick the right unit, pick the right price point for you. And then they actually sign a lease over over the over the kiosk, right? So now a live lease comes across. You sign it, you swipe your credit card. It is literally business in a box done by a kiosk, and so it's completely virtual and allows for the tenants to be able to access, come and go as they please, write a lease, not wait for, you know, you know, what if I'm going home at, at seven o'clock at night on my way home from work and I want to rent a storage facility, but they're closed for the day, not here, right? This is going to be open. As long as the gates are open, people will be able to access this and come in and uh, potentially rent a unit at their leisure, at their time, right? Um, so I think that, you know, bringing this thing into the next generation, bringing it into the future, um, a lot of it is how do we become the state-of-the-art facility people love to interact with right anything to add guys well obviously that also saves you know cost a lot of these facilities um historically have somebody on site 24 hours a day you know you're building an apartment for somebody you're having that manager there like i said on site and and when they're off you need a second person to be there on site so th this alleviates a lot of that overhead cost yeah yeah, big time. I mean, look, a lot of the a lot of the antiquated facilities, believe it or not, actually have um, property managers living on site. Like they have an apartment above the storage unit, right? So it's like, you know, do you want that? You want that like old school, you know, like <laughs> to guys living above my, my unit kind of thing, or like, yeah, hey, yeah. this is technology. These guys get it. You know, um, 
you know, I tell you what, we deal with people every single day um, in the in the single family residential space still, and you know, just communicating with them. People don't even want to pick up the phone and talk, let alone see you in person, right? They want to text everything. They want to they want to DocuSign stuff. Like they want to do full transactions without ever seeing you in person. No, nothing could be further from the nothing could be more true than the, the storage business where it's like, man, I just want to go around a locker and put my crap in. Like, right. I, don't, I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to socialize. I don't want to, you know, worry about what I'm wearing. Like, I just want to come in, swipe my credit card and go to my locker. Right. So we make it as clean and as simple and as least amount of friction as possible to get the tenant interested, get them interested in whatever discount or special we're running, get them on board and get them in there and get them signed before they change their mind or they wait you know, to go to the next facility. I want them, I want them uh, taking the speed approach to, uh, to getting signed up, right? For sure. Cool. We'll wrap this up, guys. I know it's running late. I appreciate you guys um, hanging on with us. It's exciting stuff for us. I hope you're as excited as we are. Let's talk about the team a little bit. Um, what does it look like as far as who we partnered with? Um, a, you already know, we've got the Vincent brothers on here. They're handling uh, all the investment stuff on the front end. Um, being able to screen uh, accredited investors, making sure we're a good fit for you and you're a good fit for us, um, getting you all signed up and getting the money transferred. Um, but what happens once we're once we're operational, once we're moving? Well, uh, number one, we have um, some great technology for managing the money, managing the fund, making sure people get paid on time, you get accurate K-1 forms, the tax distribution stuff. Um, so investor management service is going to handle that for us. Um, second piece is, um, of course, we are... Um, partnered up with cutting edge development, right? These guys uh, are the ones that do our feasibility reports, our marketing updates, um, help us decide what type of marketing to use to get people in the door. Um, and also they, they provide a lot of construction support and reporting for us. So um, they've also helped us tremendously just connecting us with um, different uh, contractors and, so, and such like that to, uh, to get the thing designed and get it ultimately built. Um, and then last but not least, a third party property management company, right? We're gonna be able to um, find someone who, who wants to be vested in this deal, get the thing rented, do the proper SEO, do the proper marketing, uh, make sure that, that there's call center support and um, every every customer who raises their hand and says, I need a storage facility, we want to capitalize on that and find a way to get them in the door and, and get them signed up. So, anything I missed on that, fellas? No, pretty straightforward. Cool. No, yeah, that's good. I just wanted to, and I don't know whether you touched on this or not, uh, Joe, but could, could you just talk about uh, your lo location, Legacy's location relative to the to the units? You guys yeah. are are not far. I think that's huge for uh, for for an investment and in, uh, knowing that the property manager and the folks behind the scenes are are not on the other side of the country. Yeah, absolutely, man. We're we're definitely not like uh, you know fly by night uh, kind of kind of crew that's just coming in and doing this and leaving. Uh, this first site is probably what eight miles from our office, Brian. Maybe less. Yeah, um, eight nine miles. Yeah, uh, right down the street from our from our current office location. Uh, we have a, a beautiful Class A building uh, that you guys are welcome to come knock on the door, and come chat with us, and have coffee, and um, you know uh, entertain yourself. We all talk of self storage and investments, but um, you know we're, we're we're right down the street from it. Uh, we have um, some new facilities going up uh, in the future that are also close by. We're starting with this one, we're moving through, and then we'll get to the next one. But for now, this is not only an amazing location, it does happen to be right by us. Uh, any trouble, any questions, any thoughts, any problems, you know, we can run there, we can be there in 10 minutes, and then we can take care of it. Not that I plan on having to do that, you know, but uh, uh, right yeah. management in place, you know, this thing should work. Yeah, I mean, asset, asset management, you know, would be Legacy's role in this whole deal, and it's really important mm -hmm. to be able to touch and, and, and get to the property you know, because even though this is brand new, right, if somebody's, you know, this third party manager um, isn't able, you know, isn't to be held accountable, things slip quickly. So um, I think that's really important as an asset manager that you're able to drive by frequently, be able to touch the place and be able to give a thorough review of these uh, property managers to ensure, you know, you guys are secure. Of course, the investors are secure and that the um, property is being maintained like it should. Oh, 100 percent. And this is right on my way to the shore, right on, right on Brian's way to the shore. So <laughs> do it, do it on your way, there. on your way there, not on the way back. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll be checking off frequently and checking in frequently. I mean, this is, uh, you know, again, it's going to be, it's going to be a great class A structure. We're super excited to get this thing out of the ground and get things started. So, um, you know, guys, if you're watching and something that's interesting for you or something that's interesting for a friend of yours, maybe you know it's good for your retirement account. Uh, there's a lot of creative ways you can help 
to get people involved in this. Um, I'm happy to answer any any detailed questions you have about the industry, about the location, about the design, about anything, right? I'm, I'm an open book, and I know Brian is as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, you know, contact us. Uh, reach out to us. Go into Facebook. Um, you can message me there directly. Um, we'll actually also post. Uh, Matt, can you post my cell phone across the bottom? You guys can always call or text me directly on the uh, on, on this deal as well. Um, and uh, we're happy to answer questions for you. So, um, guys, what else did I miss? I mean, it was, I, I think it was good. I just I feel like it, it took ten minutes, and here we are an hour. So I don't want to keep people all here on night. Yeah, no, I, you know, uh, I thought you did really well. It, it, it appears very clear to me, but of course, we've been part of this baby for a while. So, you know, I'll, I'll chime in with some boring legal content here for anybody that wants to uh, take some action, find out more. There's certain SEC compliance we're, we're rolling with here. So um, if you guys do have an interest, DM or text or whatever um, and get that rolling. But there's there's essentially going to be this long legal document called a private placement that's going to discuss the details of the project. It's going to have the operating agreement. So if you're one of the uh, investor members, it'll, it'll describe how the company's um, going to be run and everybody's role and then how your money will be cared for and how it will be paid off and those details. And if it's something to move forward on, you 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 know we run you through the game of being an accredited investor. There's a subscription agreement that you actually will complete with our help if you need it. Of course, you should have your own legal counsel with you, but to confirm that you are buying what you want to buy, and um, that'll get you part of this deal and, and moving forward. So, you know, if if you need to contact you know Joe, and then we can obviously set up conference calls. This isn't the only time we're going to talk about this. Um, I presume Joe's going to drag us back on here again, maybe tomorrow. I don't know. Just kidding. <laughs> um, but um, no, man, yeah, we're just excited about it. And if anybody has any questions, of course, we're always available. Yeah, yeah. Bottom line, guys, the $3 million raise. Um, we, will, uh, we will look to have this whole entire thing wrapped up um, you know, in the next two weeks or so. Uh, we've got tons of verbal commitments going through the process now and getting them in, 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 the, uh, in all the steps that uh, Paul just talked about. So, uh, if something that's interesting to you or someone else that you might know, again, feel free to reach out, send me a text, follow up. If you know Brian, if you know these guys, if you know the Vincent Bros, hit them up as well. I got the information and uh, we will chat with you about it. So, good, good call, guys. Good, good work, Joe. Good work, Brian. Thanks, good nice job, guys. Yeah, of course. That was fun. Awesome. We'll catch up with you later. See you. Thanks, guys.